صح كده بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد أشرف خلق الله أجمعين يسعدني اليوم ويشرفني وصول الأستاذ الدكتور عبد العظيم الدولاتي أستاذنا العظيم ربنا يبارك في عمره وفي صحته يا رب هو بيعلمنا حاجات كتير قوي قوي غير العلم بيعلمنا ازاي ان الانسان متوا... لازم يكون متواضع ولازم يمد ايده لكل الناس اللي هم بيطلبوا مساعدته او كده فربنا يكرمه يا رب بخيري الدنيا والاخره ويسعد قلبه ويقر عينه يا رب اللهم امين آه فشكرا لحضرتك لتشريفك المنوفيه اناتيزيا كلاب متشكره جدا لحضرتك ويسعدني اليوم ان يكون المدريتو معانا استاذنا والرائع النبيل دكتور محمد الطحان حضرتك دكتور محمد اتفضل قدم الدكتور عبد العظيم واتفضلوا يا فندم اتفضلوا شكرا لحضرتك يا بروف ليديز اند جنتلمان فيرست اوف اول اي وونت تو ابريشيت اند اكسبريس ماي امبريشن اند ثانكس فور بروفيسور صفاء هلال فور هير تريفيك وورك تو ستارت ذيس فيرجوال انستيزيا كلاب فروم مونيفيا انستيزيا بين اند انتنسيف كير كلاب اون ريجولار ويكلي بيزيس ويتش از جريت انديد And uh, here I, I'm also so delighted to introduce as the only speaker in this panel, uh, my professor and mentor, Professor Abdul Azim Dawlatli. He's the founder and uh, for uh, the many of things and started from a co-founder for the Saudi Journal of Anesthesia. And he's currently the editor-in-chief in the same journal, which is growing so fast in the Middle East. Meanwhile, he is one of the pioneers of thoracic anesthesia in the Middle East and Saudi Arabia. Um, he's um, a talented speaker and he has a long experience in teaching, education, and scientific research in different fields, including neurosurgery, bariatric surgery, and also as well as for uh, thoracic anesthesia. He's a founder for the fellowship program for thoracic anesthesia at King Saud University in Riyadh. And he's currently a professor of anesthesia in the College of Medicine in King Saud University, medical city of King Saud University in Riyadh. And um, we have a problem. You might um, turn your day from a good day into a nightmare. In the morning, you started your thoracic case. You started early and you started to isolate lungs. And once the surgeon started thoracoscopy, was introducing the truckers, he has been hampered with incomplete lung deflation which can be a nightmare, not only for you as an anesthetist, but also for the surgeon. During the following minutes, Professor Dawlatli will explain to us his experience and evidence available for tips and the tricks to exhibit and promote lung deflation techniques. Professor Dawlatli, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Mohammed, for this nice introduction. And I'd like to... Um, uh, extend my sincere thanks to Professor Safa for her kind invitation to join this uh, interesting group. And uh, actually, I thank her for her endless effort to promote our speciality. Uh, my presentation, as uh, Prof. Tahan said, is regarding the airway management tips and the tricks in lung deflation techniques. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, why I call it lung deflation and not lung isolation. In a minute, you are going to hear these uh, details about it. These are the lectures outline. I'm going to start with the lung deflation techniques. I'm going to focus on the double human tube issues in terms of the size and the insertion depth. And then I'll move on to the bronchial blockers and the update in this field. And I'll finish with take home message. I declare first there's no conflict of interest. The lung deflation techniques, why I'm calling it lung deflation? Because, you know, as you might know, and I, I'm sure in your practice you face the same, that we are facing all the time clean lung, not wet lung, you know. Rarely we face wet lung syndrome which is the best example of it is bronchiectatic patients. So we really face this actually. 
and most of our cases, you know, is uh, clean cases. Uh, so the lung is clean. We are not afraid of soiling, you know, the healthy lung from the from the diseased lung. So that's why, you know, I'm calling it lung deflation techniques. Because as uh, Professor Mohammed just said, that it will, you know, what, what the surgeon want from us. The surgeon want the lung to be down, to be collapsed, you know, like a piece of meat, in order that he can operate. So that's exactly, you know, to enforce, you know, the term of lung deflation techniques. So lung deflation techniques, I used to classify it into these two categories. First is from without, and the other one is from within. What I mean from without and within. Without means that I am using single human tube, and I am using to deflate the lung capnosorax, CO2 insufflation in the pleural cavity. So the lung is going to be collapsed. From within, I'm using the tracheobronchial tree with the aid of double human tube or bronchial blockers to deflate the lung. So these are the two important techniques of lung deflation. Let us start with the first one. I'll just brief you on the first one, which is single human tube and the cabinosaurus. Actually, this technique was adopted here in uh, our hospital, and it is now cited from uh, different articles we published on the same. Different literature they are citing uh, our references. So these are the couple of um, literatures and publications which we started around 2001 and growing on uh, with the same technique. First on the left side of the screen, this is thoracoscopic sympathectomy. Usually we started this technique with uh, thoracoscopic sympathectomy bilateral one. And here there is uh, article on the endobronchial anesthesia versus endotracheal anesthesia with intrathoracic CO2 insufflation. Another article we published- Professor, I'm that. sorry to interrupt you. Oh, are you advancing your slides? We can see only your first slide. Now we have No. Can you stop sharing and start sharing again, please? All right, okay. Can you try to advance it? Are you advancing? Yeah. Yes, now it is advancing, yes. Yes, we can see it now. I'll start yeah. from here now. Yes, okay, perfect, okay. Thanks so much. Lung deflation techniques, as I said, you know, there are two techniques where we can adopt this uh, one. Is from either from without, as I said, from without means I'm not using the tracheobronchial tree to deflate the lung. And from within using the tracheobronchial tree to deflate the lung by either double human tube or bronchial blockers. And here from without using just single human tube and then CO2 insufflation in the pleural cavity in order to deflate the lung. Is it clear, Dr. Mohammed? Yes, indeed, thank you. And here, if you see, these are the, as I said, the uh, couple of publications which we started and we adopted here in our hospital. On the, especially we use, we use this technique of CO2 insufflation in thoracoscopic sympathectomy cases. And here on the left side of the screen, this is an article on endobronchial anesthesia versus endotracheal with CO2 insufflation. Another one is right versus left side thoracoscopic sympathectomy effect of CO2 insufflation in hemodynamics. This article is very important because out of this article, we concluded that CO2 insufflation on the right side is well tolerated up to 10 millimeter mercury. You can go up to 10 millimeter mercury with CO2 insufflator. But on the left side, no more than eight millimeter mercury, okay? So this is why, because of the hemodynamic effects. So just uh, take a note of that, because this is very important while you are operating 
and doing the CO2 insufflation. Uh, then there's a third uh, paper here on right versus left side sympathetomy. Oh, this is this is the same anyway. But there are another one, which another third article on the on the respiratory uh, mechanics. You know, uh, with this uh, technique, uh, I don't think it is here in this slide. So the the of note, as I said, the hemodynamic effect of capnosorex on the right side. If the surgeon operate. On the right side, always have an eye on the CO2 insufflator. The pressure should not exceed 10 centimeter water, should not by all means, okay, on the right side. On the left side, should not exceed eight centimeter water, okay? Otherwise, hemodynamic changes will occur. So just while you are operating, just while even while you are documenting the blood pressure, the heart rate, Create the space also for the CO2 insufflator pressure and put the pressure all the way, you know, monitor it during surgery. This is how it looks like. By this good deflation, as you see here, you know, this life case, you know, the, like piece of meat, you know, this is your lung here, and this is sympathetic chain. The surgeon was able to have it, you know, dissect it, and here. He is going either to clip it, you know, by putting clamps or to be down. Imagine without lung deflation, how, how this can uh, be visualized like that. At the end of this procedure, the surgeon used to do what pre-plural, you know, in, in, installation of the local anesthetic uh, just uh, beneath the subpleural, beneath the parietal pleural, okay? And this gives good analgesia because it tackles the intercostal nerves. And this is uh, just an editorial which we describe this novel technique of subpleural analgesia following thoracoscopic sympathectomy. Let us move to our subject, which is the main subject of tonight, which is from without. Is uh, Sorry, before that, let us uh, just summarize. The without technique is use a single human tumor capnosorax. Here we are using sing single human tracheal tube. And then, you know, uh, the, 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 there is a procedure, you know, uh, in order even not to injure the lung because the surgeon when he enters, before entering with a trocar to the chest cavity, he is putting the various needle in order to insufflate CO2. So when he starts to put the service, the various needle, and before that, you have to stop ventilation completely. Then the various needle inserted, and again, stop ventilation until the trocar is inserted. Then you resume ventilation. Then CO2 insufflation pressure, as I said, on the right side from eight to 10 millimeter mercury on the left side from six to eight millimeter mercury. And this is the tidal volume respiratory. At the end of the procedure, CO2 is off. Then he is going to put the elastic tube underwater seal in order to drain all CO2 out of the chest cavity. At that time, you are manually ventilate the patient and you repeat this same technique on the other side and then the patient go to the PACU safely. So this is how we do this procedure in thoracoscopic sympathectomy cases. Let us move to the uh, our main subject on the from within technique using the tracheobronchial tree in order to achieve lung deflation. As I said, we are going to mention a uh, couple of things, you know, and techniques and uh, tubes, either old and new tubes. And we'll start with the double human tube issues. This is how you think of the double human tube. You know, any, any use of double human tube, you have to think of the following. Is this right or left side double human tube? So it means identification of it. And what is the indication of each? Number two, you think of the size of the double human tube, which fits your patient. And we'll show you in a minute how we do that. And don't forget, there are complications of double human tube. Double human tubes are not very safe, by the way. And I'll show you a couple of airway traumas secondary to the use of double human tube. 
So airway trauma. The other thing which is important, you know, coming nowadays on surface is insertion depth of double human tubes. I'm going to show you details of each. First, let us start with the right and left side of double human tube. How to identify right from left? And this is, you know, for our junior colleagues in order that they are, uh, have to be familiar with the identification of the, of the tube. And what is the indication of each? This is how we identify. This is the right side of the human tube. And this is the endobronchial portion. And you can see there is slot opening here. By the way, you know, it's mentioned everywhere. This is a Murphy eye. You know, I, I, I don't think, I don't think it is Murphy eye. You know, it's called Murphy eye. But, you know, what I like to call it is um, just the slot opening, which is a, to be placed opposite the right upper lobe bronchus orifice. Okay, so, but uh, you call it Murphy eye, you know, some, 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 some books you call it like that, but you know, most of the references, you don't call it Murphy eye. And here, the other one, which is the left side of the WM tube. This is the endobronchial portion of the left side of the WM tube. You can appreciate that there is no opening as in the right side. So this is how we differentiate between the right. Of course, there is also curvature of it, you know, the endobronchial left side, it goes to the left side, you know, this one, the curvature go to the left and here the bending is toward the right main bronchus. So this is another thing, but the main feature why this is left and this is right is the opening here for the right side, you know, uh, at the endobronchial uh, part, you know, which is placed using fiber optic bronchoscopy opposite the right upper lobe bronchus orifice. This is again the right side of the human tube. There are different manufacturers, and still you can find this opening here, you know, slot here, slit opening, and here the fiber optic bronchoscope. And this is a very famous sign, which is atrial anterior and posterior, which is Mercedes sign. You know, this is the right upper lobe bronchus orifice with three segments. So the, with the use of fiber optic bronchoscope, you place it like that. This one has to be opposite. So you can tell me, you know, how, how we're going to fix it, you know, because if the patient, you know, can be advanced with just the flexion of the neck of the patient, this can be advanced in. And if you extend the neck position, you know, while you are turning the patient to one side, then it can come a little bit out. So partial occlusion can happen and no proper <coughs> ventilation to the right upper lobe uh, uh, bronchus. So this is this can happen, you know, and that's what we call it the safety margin of the double human tube. What what I mean by safety margin? Safety margin is the the length, you know, the length of this one. And how far the patient, the tube can be uh, in and out, you know, with any patient movements without obstructing the right upper lobe bronchus orifice. So most of the manufacturers they focus on this, you know, this has to be long enough. This opening in the endobronchial portion of the right tube has to be long enough in order that if the tube uh, advances in or out, doesn't cause obstruction to the right upper lobe. That's what we call it, the safety margin of the right side of the double human tube. Just remember this term. This term is an old one. And uh, still, you know, till now it is valid. And to be honest, the best tube with the best safety margin is a rush tube, which is behind me here on the board. I don't know if you can see it or not, but uh, this is the red rubber, which we were using it before a lot, you know. This is a rush uh, uh, rubber double human tube. This is the best safety margin among all double human tubes, left side of double human, uh, sorry, right side of double human tube. Until now, there is no even new manufacturers. You don't succeed to give us the best safety margin for this uh, orifice in order to avoid obstruction and no ventilation to the right upper lobe. Let's move uh, forward, you know, before we move forward, just I'll take you to this uh, tracheobronchial anatomy. And here, you know, you don't need to go into segments in details, but just a quick review on the right uh, lung, for example, upper lobe, as I said, the segments, apical, posterior, anterior, you know, that's why, you know, fiber optic bronchoscope is an intimate to so as you can see the surface. So just um, 
just uh, you have to be also trained on that, you know, use of it. Middle loop there is here. When you go further, you go to the bronchus intermedius, and then you go for the middle lobe, lateral medial, and then the lower lobe, superior and medial, uh, lateral, anterior, and posterior. These are the segments. There are 10 on the right side and nine on the left side. Actually, when you go with a fiber optic to check the tube, you visualize the main carina. This is the main thing you have to visualize, okay? And then you visualize that if for left side, the double human tube, that the cuff, endobronchial cuff, should be just placed below the carina. And then you go for the left side, you know, lumen of the double human tube to see the secondary carina. Here is the secondary carina between the upper loop and the lower loop, okay? So that's why, you know, some of the people, when they start learning this left side double human tube insertion, they said, okay, we're inserted like that. Then we turn it uh, uh, 90 degrees uh, anticlockwise to the left side. And we push until there is resistance. You know, most of the people, they tell us like that. But this is not correct, you know. You don't push until resistance. If you push until resistance, means that the endobronchial portion is lodged here in the lower uh, low bronchus on the left side. So there will be no ventilation to the upper loop, left upper loop. Okay? So, I, I, so that is why, you know, very important in order to properly place left side the double human tube with a fiber optic scope, essential to use it. You have to visualize the carina, secondary carina, we call it. It has to be visualized and two orifices has to be visualized, one for the left upper loop and one for the left lower loop. Okay? Let us show you uh, one video, I hope it will work. And how we use the different, the fiber optic bronchoscope in recognizing the different lung segments. This is one of our cases, live cases. I hope the video is working nice, uh, Dr. Mohammed. Yes, it works. This is the left, uh, this is the right upper lobe. You can see the three segments, apical, anterior, and posterior. And then we go to the bronchus intermedius. This is the middle lobe. And this is the uh, lower lobe. This is the middle lobe, right and medial segments. And this is the lower lobe here. We see superior. Uh, or apical, anterior, posterior, lateral, and medial, five uh, segments here. So we are still in the in the right side. You can see here the uh, you know membranous part is posterior, and the cartilaginous part is anterior. And this is how you can differentiate uh, the anterior from posterior. Still, I am in the lower lobe of the right side. We'll go out again to see the main carina. This is the main carina, primary carina. And then this is the left side. We are going into the left side to see the secondary carina between the lower lobe and the upper lobe on the left side. I'm sorry, it is a bit slow, but uh, it's it's very clear, I, I think. So we go down, down. This is secondary current, okay? And then we have to see the lower and we have to see the upper lobe. So that is what we have to visualize, you know. If this visualized secondary carina, then you stop. You don't advance more the uh, W mature, okay? Is it clear? So let us move to... What is the indication of left versus right sided double human tube? Actually, most of our cases we are using the left sided double human tube. And the reason why, as I told you, you know, regarding the ventilation of the right upper lobe bronchus. So, this is the main, main uh, problem with the right sided double human tube. So, 
the main problem, as I said, is obstruction of the right upper lobe, which if you if you fail to ventilate the uh, uh, right uh, upper lobe uh, of the right side. And these are the conditions where a right side W tube is mandatory, you know. Out, out of those, you know, left side the W tube is indicated. So we can we can't use left side the W tube if there is left main stem bronchus obstruction, all right? Or left main stem sleep resection. This is a procedure. Or any left tracheobronchial disruption or anatomic distortion making left main stem intubation difficult. So that's like descending aortic aneurysm. Also, it's difficult to place the left side of W tube. Left pneumonectomy. But you know, in left pneumonectomy, you can still use left side W tube. And at the time of stapling the left main bronchus, you can withdraw. Before that, you can withdraw the left tube, the left uh, side of W tube. And this is all, you know, uh, dialogue has to be initiated between surgeon and the anesthesiologist in order to choose whether to use the right or left side of the W tube. Actually, you know, in that regard, you know, the 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 uh, communication between the surgeon and the thoracic anesthesiologist is highly required in thoracic anesthesia service. By the way, you know, I used to tell my residents that the best chapter of thoracic anesthesia is in the textbook of thoracic surgery. It's written, of course, by anesthesiologists, and I find it the best uh, chapter of thoracic anesthesia. There is a textbook, uh, Champerlin, I think, is uh, the author of it in thoracic surgery, and it is very, very well described, you know, regarding the anesthesia points, you know, with a background of the surgeon perspectives. So that's what you need. You need also to know what are the techniques the surgeon is doing, you know, because both of you sharing the same airway. So I think it's important to know what are the steps and techniques the surgeon is doing for the lung and tracheobronchial tree in order to meet the demand, you know, for that and to avoid any complications. So that's why I call the uh, thoracic anesthesia service is the best model for a good communication and rapport between the surgeon and the anesthesiologist. Let us move to the other important point of the left side the double human tube, which is the size of the tube. There are different methods, which we, which sides, you know, the patient came in and you wanted to get a selected double human tube, left side the double human tube, which size? The technician is going to ask you or your resident or your fellow. Then there are different methods. There are measured and conventional. Let us see what are the measured methods we have. This table, this Prodesky table, uh, which is uh, uh, you can use if if you like, which is the measurements of the tracheal width and the bronchial diameter. You have the chest X-ray. You can measure the tracheal width, the diameter. And then CT scan, you can measure the bronchial diameter. And if it is for tracheal diameter more than 18 millimeter, for example, and they measure the bronchial diameter more than 12, then you select 41 French left side W human tube, and so on. You can go ahead and, and use this table. But do you think this is practical? I, I think it is not. You know, and I don't, I don't use it. You know, in my practice, I never use it, but I use it only for teaching, actually, purposes, in order just to highlight the importance of having an idea about the tracheal and the bronchial diameter. But this one makes things a bit easy, which is height-based formula. This is Linger in 2001. He published it for females, for example, a height 160 centimeter. He used to put the 37 French, less than 160 centimeter, 35 French tube, left-sided, less than 152 centimeter, 32, and for males, more than 170 centimeter, 41 French, less than 170 centimeter, 39, and less than 160 centimeter, 37. This is a height-based 
formula on the size of the left side of W omega U. That was adopted in 2001 by Peter Slinger. There is another method here, which is uh, newly came into 2020, published in uh, uh, Dr. Mohammed Journal, Journal of Cardiothoracic Vascular Anesthesia, on the prediction of W tube size by ultrasonography. This is for Asian women. This is Chinese article. So here, what they said, they said that the size of W tube based on the tracheal diameter ultrasound. So that what they use the ultrasound in order to measure the tracheal diameter as appearing in this uh, slide down. Considering that the deflated tracheal cuff adds about half millimeter to the tube's external diameter. So they measured the size of the W tube left side were selected as follow. 30, 37 French tube for tracheal diameter using ultrasound more than 14 millimeters. 35 French less than 14 millimeter, 32 French, less than 13 millimeter tracheal diameter uh, using the ultrasound. So this is a newly coming methods. I think it has to be uh, attested by other investigators. But it's, uh, it's something which uh, came recently in our field. Then we'll move to the conventional. What is the conventional way of using, of, of selecting the size for the thoracic patient? This is what most of us use. This is, we use for females, size 35 or 35 French, depending on the stature of the patient, your assessment, you know, uh, or this one or this one. It depends on your visual assessment to the patient, you know, airway. And for males, we use 39, 41 for uh, French for males. Actually, in my practice for the last maybe seven to 10 years, I don't use except, I don't use except 35 for females and 37 for males. Even I don't go, I never went, go, went for 39 or 41 at all. And I'll show you why I'm doing that, you know. Because of this one, airway trauma. There are a couple of reports, whether uh, case reports, solitary case reports, or an, an article, you know, you know, and published articles on the number of cases where airway trauma happened secondary to, to this uh, using left side W mature. And this one recently published in anesthesia and analgesia airway rupture caused by W tubes, review of 187 cases. That was published in the and Allergies in 2020. Literature search for all cases of airway rupture caused by W tube was performed in this lecture, in this literature. 105 single case reports and 22 case series with a total number of 187 cases. Most of the ruptures were in the trachea, around 52%, and left main bronchus, around 37%. And what was the etiology of this airway trauma secondary to W tube? Style it. And there is a common mistake, you know, whenever you go to insert the uh, left side of W tube, you insert, you know, under, of course, either video laryngoscopy or uh, McIntosh uh, direct laryngoscopy. Then you turn it to the left side and you don't remove the style. Style it has to be removed. Once the endobronchial portion is subglottic, then you remove, don't advance while the style is on board. It has to be removed. Otherwise, injury can happen because sometimes style it can protrude, you know, beyond the tip of the, uh, the uh, bronchial part of the W tube. And this can cause injury. And this is one of the, on top of the reasons of airway trauma is the stylet. The other thing is cuff over distension. Usually when we go in, then we just ask for inflation, you know, of the cuffs, you know. But you know, you can inflate the endobronchial cuff. Let us say we used to do it uh, three millimeter air. And, uh, but you know, sometimes it's, it's over distended, you know, with this three even. So you have to do it under vision. And even, 
if you wanted to uh, adjust the tube later on, if you want to adjust the tube either in or out, don't do it with an, in, with an inflated cuff. You have to deflate the cuff, adjust your tube, and then inflate the cuff again under the shunt, the endobronchial cuff, I mean. The third cause of this trauma was multiple attempts to adjust the deposition of the W mature. And this is also one of the problems which can happen that you attempt uh, once, twice, thrice. But in that case, you know, I think you have to call for some assistance, you know. A case of difficult intubation also. Difficult intubation means you are going to have multiple attempts if you don't have, you know, a clear plan how to deal with difficult intubation for a thoracic patient then you, you will go for, uh, let us say, multiple attempts, and again, airway trauma. And here, you know, one important thing which they have mentioned here, and this will support my saying about the use of the size, which is the use of oversized WM tube, okay? Oversized WM tube. So if you are using the size, let us say, which is 35 for females, and 37 for males, you know, for left side W tube, I do think you will be safe. Most of airway ruptures happen with those 187 cases where diagnosed interoperatively, okay? Pneumomediastinum, air leak, hypoxemia, and subcutaneous emphysema. And all these, you know, require surgical repair, which is around 78% of the cases. Mind you, that the mortality of the patients with airway rupture by double human tubes was almost 9%. So I think uh, this, uh, this uh, article will uh, alert all of us of the, how important it is to select the size of the double human tube in order to avoid all these complications. This is a couple of pictures of the airway trauma. Here, for example, the bronchostroma, as you see. Yeah, you know. And here also, uh, this uh, iatrogenic trachea rupture during intubation was left side W tube published in 2009. Here, and you can see here, and here is the after repair sutures. And this one is a recent one, 2021. You know, still coming, you know. Uh, pay, uh, case reports of that tracheobronchial trauma from W tube placement in patients undergoing lung transplantation. Yeah, I mean, it's more than enough to have a patient with lung transplantation. And on top of that, there is tracheobronchial trauma with W tube. So I think we have to be very careful. You see, the trauma is here appearing, you know. And this is another case on the treatment of tracheobronchial injuries. And, uh, and here are the number of things. This is one of the things which is stenting, you know, and here is repair, repair, and so on. So these are the things just to make you oriented about the, that could happen, by the way, it could happen. And here, this is a case report, you know, published 2013 on iatrogenic lift main stem injury following atraumatic W tube placement. And here is a site of injury, as you see. And this is another one. And you can see here that the part of the W distal cuff of the W tube is through the right bronchus here, as you see, you know. So this is all atrogenic cases, you know, and sit like this intra operative tracheobronchial injury, you know, it happened. So it is visible in the thoracoscopic view. You can see it, you know, is here, you know, this part of the tube, you know, appearing here, visualized on that, in the right bronchus. So out of those, you know, regarding the size is the, these recommendations, you know, that I just collected these recommendations, which can be fits, you know, in order to avoid any injuries to the tracheobronchial tree using left side W tube. These are the recommendations. Size of left side W tube, I used to say 35 for females, 37 for, for, for males. You don't need to use 
neither 39 or 41 at all, by the way. Anticipate difficult airway. If you anticipate the difficult airway, you go for double human tube one size down than usual. If you are, if you wanted to still use double human tube and no bronchial blockers. Avoid forceful intubation. Avoid repeated attempts and forceful intubation. Remove the stylet as soon as the bronchial cap passes vocal cord. This is very important, as we said. Fiber optic bronchoscope should be used routinely. There is no thoracic anesthesia without fiber optic bronchoscope. And to be honest, there is no consensus here on that. If you don't use fiber optic bronchoscope for a thoracic patient, so uh, this means you are uh, putting yourself in, 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 in a bad position and the patient will be at risk actually. Tracheal and bronchial cuffs should be inflated slowly. As we said, you know, inflate slowly, especially bronchial cuff to be inflated slowly and under vision in order to avoid any over distension of the cuff. And subsequently, there will be bronchus rupture. Both cuffs should be deflated when the tube repositioned. If you wanted to adjust the tube position, then both cuffs, bronchial and the tracheal cuff should be deflated and then position or reposition the tube and then inflate the tracheal cuff and then inflate the bronchial cuff slowly and under vision. So these are the recommendations uh, regarding the use of the size of double human tube. Uh, there are so many nowadays around three new tubes arrived in the market. This one is around 10 years old now. This is still bronch, you know, the previous ones I showed you, double human tubes were PVC, and this one is a silicon tube. So the silicon tube, as you know, the silicon is different from the PVC material-wise. Silicon is, uh, doesn't affect it by the patient temperature, not like the PVC. Silicon material doesn't cause any tracheobronchial mucosal irritation, not like the uh, PVC. Here, this tube in particular, the Cell bronch, it has a reinforced tip, which is very flexible and doesn't cause any trauma to the tracheobronchial tree versus the PVC type. So this is the difference between the cell bronch and the PVC W tubes. This is a very nice tube, and I think uh, it's uh, worse to have it in your setting. And this is how we insert it in this video. This is the reinforced part appearing here. And this is the cuff. Now you will see the cuff inflated. It is above the carina. So how to reposition it? You know, we have to deflate it and push. Don't, don't push the tube while it is inflated, as we said. Deflate and then push down the carina and then slowly inflate the cuff. It's one of the things which can happen for double human tube insertion. We call it the cuff herniation, that the cuff herniated above the carina. So in order to reposition it, just deflate and deflate the cuff and push it under vision, all using the fiber optic bronchoscope in the tracheal lumen. You can see everything. Don't do anything blind, huh? And then you inflate the, the blue cuff. Okay, and that's it. So this is how we place the, uh, this one, the, uh, the left-sided uh, cell bronch W. Here, if you wanted to uh, improve oxygenation during one leg ventilation, there are different you know, methods and algorithms for that, but it is beyond this talk. But I just wanted to show you this you know, half liter bag, which is melancholic bag and with this valve, you know, and this is connected to the C, C bag, connected to the collapsed lung. And here, if you wanted to improve oxygenation, 
and everything else was normal, tube wise is well positioned and no problem and no secretions and you know you revise everything. So what is left is to deal with the PEEP to the dependent lung and then think of the CPAP for the non-dependent lung because not all patients tolerate PEEP, especially if there is any hemodynamic instability. So this one is, is, is important to have it, you know, for all your thoracic patients connected to the deflated lung, to the lung is going to be expanded, but not ventilated. But in if before putting it, you have to alert the surgeon that you are going to do that because suddenly he will find the lung inflated, a little bit inflated. There is pressure from one to 10 centimeter water. You can adjust it. It depends on the how severe is the hypoxemia. It's very useful and you should have it in your set, uh, setting of thoracic anesthesia. There is another tube, which is, uh, uh, you call it the triple cuffed double human tube. What is the idea of it? This is the South Korean one. This you call it the Angkor tube. Here you can find, you can see there are three cuffs. Huh? This one is a tracheal cuff. And this is the usual one, which is the bronchial cuff. And there is another cuff here also in between, which is the third cuff, you know. And here is the third cuff. What is the idea of it? I'll show you in a minute what is the idea of it. Let us move, see this one. This is the tube. And you can see here, this is the cuff, green cuff. And the blue is the bronchial cuff. And this is the tracheal cuff. So. You insert it like any other left side of the W on the tube, move it to the left, anticlockwise, and you stop. Then inflate the green cuff, which is this one, with six cc air. The green one. Okay. Is, okay. Then, what happened? Then this push, cuff is going to be on the right side. And there is and a the distance. Once it is a distance, you are okay. There is so, no point that the tube is going to be And then you deflate this okay. one. Once you are in, you and deflate this one. And, one. Is and, is and there is a resistance. You stop and okay. deflate the green cuff and push the double human tube and then start to deflate the bronchial and the tracheal cuffs. Okay? Exactly. So you can direct the tube to the left side. You know, sometimes, you know, if we practice thoracic kinesia, sometimes you'll find this, that you push the tube to the left side, then suddenly you will find the tube on the right side. So why this happened? There are so many factors, you know, this, especially if you have a trainee with you, you know, it, it happens several times, you know. So one has to um, accept that this could happen. And I'll show in a minute, you know, an article which states that around 4%, you know, of the tube in advert left side of the WM tubes inadvertently goes to the right main focus. So this is the one. So let us see, this is one of our residents, you know, he is putting it, pushing the, uh, inserting the anchor tube. Six cc air, as you see here, and push until there is a removal. And then we remove the stellate and go until, until there is, is frost, until there is resistance. If there is a resistance, not going anymore. If there is a resistance, and I can only put any more, it hurts. 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 It the green cuff, and then start to inflate the blue and the tracheal cuff. Okay. 
So that is the article which I told you about. This misplacement of left-sided double human tubes into the right main bronchus. Incidence, risk factors, and blind repositioning technique that was published in, in BMC in 2015. And the incidence of this misplacement was 4%, as you see here, 4.2%. So there is a point actually to have this anchor triple cuff the double human show. Let us move to the third, third the new tube, you know, which is uh, also well, we have some samples of it we start to use, and uh, this is what you call it the viva side double human tube, viva side double human tube. This is the left side the double human tube viva side. What is the, this is Danish company. And then, you know, what, what, what is the features of this? There is an embedded camera here on the, at the end of the right uh, bronchial um, part of the double human tube. There is an embedded camera here, you know. And this camera will uh, show you, you know, they are telling that this can eliminate the use of fiber optic bronchoscope. That's what is the, claim from the company. And this is how it looked like on the screen. Let us see what we have done with this one. This is the tube, W and tube. And here, this is the camera source for the, for the, uh, for the camera. And then this one is, uh, and there is another small tube in order to clean the camera. Because you know, while you are inserting it, some of the bronchial Salivary secretion will come on it and the blur, you know, blur it. So you can clean it using this one, which is the, you can clean it using the uh, saline, you know, for cleaning it. And here, if you look for that here, this is on a mannequin. You go down, you know, now once you are in, using the whisper, I was asked if this is whisper. Okay. Any subglottic? So I just any tube. What you got to do? Once you are in, if you see here on this screen, are you see now? It's clear now. We are working with that. Yeah, shop. And then you can find all the tubes. Okay. Okay. This is the one. Now we go down, no fiber optic machine, you can watch it on the screen. Yes, it is. Yes, coming to the screen. Under the parameter and then you stop. I have used it also on one patient, you know. You know, the advantage of having it, I'll show you now how it appears on the screen. It's one of our patients. And you can see, this is the video sound screen, what the drawing of it looks like. And you can appreciate that all the way you're in the surgery, you see the, the blue cup on the screen. You can see the blue cup all the way. If any dislodgement happen up, down, or what, you know, during surgical manipulations, you will identify what happened straight away. And this is one of the advantages of having this Viva side tube. And here is an editorial published in Journal of Cardiovascular Thoracic Anesthesia 2018 on double human tube endotracheal tube placement, knowing depths of insertion first hand may make a difference. Here, the, the uh, mention that the need for fiber optic bronchoscopy guidance for conferring proper left side double human tube may be eliminated with the novel viva side video uh, LED LT, which has a high resolution camera. Actually, this is true and the light source embedded in the medial aspect of the distal end of the tracheal lumen and enables accurate placement and the continuous video monitoring of LED LED position on an external monitor. Again, multiple studies have reported that the vivaside LED LED to be associated with shorter intubation and positioning times compared with conventional LED LED because fiber optic bronchoscope is not required with the vivaside. The third thing, because the viva side LED LED provides continuous surveillance all the time you see it. It sees the cuff, you see the any advancing of the cuff in out 
any migration of LT, LT during surgery would be rapidly recognized and corrected without the need for fiber optic bronchoscope and may prevent the complications associated with conventional LT, LT. So this is three points in favor of the use of vivocyte LT, LT. We move to the another subject, which is the insertion depth of LD LT. Insertion depths, how we know that the tube is not far beyond inserted down, advanced down, or up, you know, there must be some measurements for that. And these measurements, either with use of CT-based formulae or height-based formulae. Let us see how we do that. Here, this is the CT-based formula. This is the efficacy and the adverse effects of uniblocker left-sided double human tube for one lung ventilation under guidance of the chest CT. So this is using the CT, measuring the distance from the uh, glottic uh, opening vocal cord down to the carina. And then with the use of this, you know, you can avoid any uh, insertion there, uh, difficulties, either too much in or too much out. You can use it either also for the blockers, you know. The other thing, which is a height-based insertion depth formulae. There are so many formulae available. There are five, there were five, and now we added one or ours, which we put it uh, for our patients, you know. <coughs> we <coughs> think that this one, which we published 2020, uh, fits our patients, you know, and I'll show you how we can uh, measure it. And there are so many other formula ahead, Brodsky 91, Bank, you know, 99, Chow 2, Takeda 3, and Lin 16, and then our formula. So all of these formula are what? Height-based formula, as you see. Patient height, body height, you know, this is all height-based formula, which determines the insertion depth of W human tubes. This is our first article on the WHO tube insertion depths. And this was published in 2019 in Saudi Journal of Anesthesia. And here we, we got the formula out of this article actually. And was was unintentional to be honest, you know. But we know with the Spearman correlation, we got the insertion depths on the left side and here is the height. And we got good correlation between both. And then we have the formula, our statistician developed us, you know, this formula out of this Spearman correlation, you know. So we got the formula, which was not uh, intention, you know, our intention from publishing this, that article. But we started to work on it, you know, with Dr. Tahan also, we have done this. This efficacy of height based formula, which we adopted, we got from previous work, predict the insertion depths of left side double human tube. And this was a prospective observational study. We published it in anesthesia intensive care in 2020. And we managed to have that uh, this, uh, the efficacy was uh, optimal for our patients. Actually it was here, we claim that the efficacy was around 70%. Mind you, you know, there are around 12% patients, though it was not properly, you know, as uh, in the formula uh, positioned, but you know, there was no obstruction, you know, or respiratory embarrassment, you know. So I think we can add the 70 to 12, it will come to 80, 82% efficacy. And actually, you know, we are now conducting another large study on 100 patients, you know. We are approaching 100 patients now, left side W insertion, also in order to check the efficacy of this high based formula. So how we do that practically, how we can use it, you know, you can, you just use a smart calculator like this one on the left side of the screen. You have this formula, I used, I used to have it by the way, you know, if I don't uh, use the mobile, you know, I used to have this formula, just you, this will, will be fixed on your smart calculator and just to change the height of the patient. Here, for this example, the height is 187, and then calculate, it will come to insertion depths of 30. What I mean by insertion depths, that 30 centimeter from the corner of the mouse. You push the double human tube down, 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 until you get 30 on the tube, 30 centimeter mark, marking, 
uh, which will be opposite to the corner of the mouth. Okay, and then you stop. It doesn't mean that this precludes the use of fiber optic. No, after that, you use fiber optic bronchoscope. But definitely, you know, if you use this method and then fiber optic, this will shorten the period of using fiber optic bronchoscope to check W mature. But again, it doesn't preclude the use of fiber optic bronchoscope. There was an, uh, an application on Android, which we developed, you know, uh, some time ago when it was easy, but you know, after some time it was, you know, uh, removed or deleted, I don't know, by Google. So I, I have no control on that. So anyhow, it's available on my mobile phone and most of our colleagues in the room, they have it on their mobile still. Uh, but if you don't have it, you know, you can use the, as I said, the smart calculator. Then let us move to the bronchial blockers. The bron in the bronchial blocker field, we have two things here. We have the dependent blockers and we have the independent blockers. You know, this is wide classification of this bronchial blockers. Dependent blockers, like the one example available, which is the torque control blocker, Univent TCP. Dependent means that the blocker is attached to the anterior shaft of the single human tube. It's not removed the blocker, it's fixed there. But the blocker is mobile in and out, but cannot remove it, okay? That's why we call it dependent blocker because it depends on the single human tube in its position. We'll show you in a minute what do you mean by it. The other type is independent blockers, okay? They are separated blockers. You can use through the either extra luminal or through the uh, single human tube. There is wide wire guided endobronchial blocker. This is George Arnett, he's an anesthetist. And tip deflecting endobronchial blocker. This is Edmund Cohen. Uni blocker, this is from Fuji. East blocker, this Holland company. Coupe de bronchial blocker from Japan. And Taba blocker from China. So these are the different independent blockers which are available in the market. By the way, you know, you might think that this bronchial blocker is a very new thing. You know, it is not new, but you know, there are new versions of it. But the first bronchial blocker was this one, 1936 introduced by Megal bronchial blocker. Okay, so it is not new. And then there is uh, Eno tube, which is TCP or the uh, Univenti tube, which is the dependent blocker, 1982. Then Cohen blocker, uh, sorry, George Arnett blocker, 1999. And 2004, the Cohen blocker, endobronchial blocker, tip deflecting. And then Coop deck uh, bronchial blocker, Japanese one, 2003. And East blocker, 20 from Holland, 2011. So these are the uh, manufacturer years of each of these blockers. Let us start with the dependent blockers. The TCP, the univenti tube, as you see here, the blocker is here attached to the anterior shaft of the, of the single univent, single tube, uh, lumen tube, you see, this one. And this is a blocker here, you cannot remove. And here you can advance it in and out after you position the single lumen tube. So this is how we do that. So it is single lumen tube with different sizes. There are different sizes of it. There is a pediatric size 3.5, but not to be used less than six years old uh, patients. You know why? Because the external diameter here is large, you know, because if you add this to the external diameter of this um, single human tube, it will come higher than to be accommodated for a child less than six years old. This is the smallest size. There is a size four, four and a half, five, six, and so on, seven and a half and seven. This is how you insert it. This is a single human tube, you know. You retract the blocker to be uh, not protruding, and then you insert single human tube. <coughs> the trick here, this is a membranous part, and this is tracheal part, posterior and anterior. Now visualize, <coughs> tube is inserted. Then we are going to advance the the uh, blocker, which is a torque control blocker. It's advanced to the right side. 
You might say that it's easy to read the right side. I agree with you, but there is a torque where you can control it to go to the left side. And the, even with certain external laryngeal manipulations, you can do that, it can help you. And here is the cuff inflated and it is in place. So this is how we can position the torque control or the inner tube, univented tube, okay? Inu is a thoracic surgeon, a Japanese thoracic surgeon. I'm trying to here, trying to not over distend, you know, over inflate the cuff. As we said, you know, we have to take a note of that. Let us move to the independent blockers. The independent blockers, <clears throat> we have the George Arnold blocker, which is wire endobronchial blocker. The feature of it is the nylon loop here. As you see here, you can see it. There is a nylon loop at the tip of it, you know, where the shaft of fiber optic bronchoscope go through this four-way adapter. All independent blockers, they have four-way adapter like this, four-way adapter. Fix it here, single human tube, largest possible size single human tube. And then you fix this adapter here to the castor mount of the tube and here to the respirator and then here to fiber optic bronchoscope and this one through the, uh, the, the blocker will go through. So this is four-way adapter. This is applied for all independent blockers. You go with this uh, fiber optic scope to the in between the nylon loop and then you tighten. There is a screw out here out of the the blocker where you tighten it, you know, over the shaft of the of the uh, uh, fiber optic bronchoscope, and you go where wherever you want. You know, it can have a selective lower blockade. By the way, you know, if the patient doesn't tolerate one lung ventilation and uh, you want only one lobe to be uh, deflated or isolated, then you can use this one. It can serve for selective lung blockade as well. This is a tip deflecting uh, blocker from Edmund Cohen. You know, it has a feature here that there is a wheel on the proximal end of it, and there is an arrow on the distal end of it. And this wheel, whenever you go in, you direct the arrow toward either right side or left side. Once you direct it like that, let us say to the right side, then you turn in the wheel, you know. Once you turn the wheel, it go to the right side and vice versa. This one is a Fuji blocker. This is uni blocker from uh, Fuji. And uh, also the same, you know, there is a uh, four-way adapter and this is uh, independent blocker, which is separate one. It can be placed through, as I said, you know, large as possible size single human tube. Then you fix this one, then you negotiate to put this one. Okay, this is like hockey stick. Uh, tip here is angulated. You call it the hockey stick. A tip. And here, this is one patient, you know, uh, we don't do routinely the um, uh, pediatric thoracic anesthesia, but our colleagues in pediatrics, sometimes you call us for some cases from their side. They're like this patient, this is 5.5 year old female for thoracoscopic post-mediastinal mass resection. And here in this case, you know, we were just used, we used the, the uh, Fuji blocker in that. But we put it uh, extra luminal actually through, and then we after that we put the five. Uh, this was five French, and then we put five and a half single lumen tube beside it. Okay, so we use it as extra luminal as you will see here. So this is the, the uh, Fuji blocker inserted already extra lumen uh, in, inside between vocal cords. This open. And then we are going to insert the five and a half. So food can be extra human. And here you can appreciate the amount of the pattern of lung collapse. Lung collapse is excellent, and the surgery is going in, is going on without any problems. You can see the surgeon here is stitching, and there is no problem with the lung infection. So it can serve, you know, these five French 
Fuji blocker can be used extra luminous. And this is another case. <clears throat> this is 15 year old boy where also we use the Fuji blocker and you can see the surgery is going on, stapling of one loop or uh, maybe segmentectomy. And you can see, you can appreciate the lung is nicely collapsed with use of this one. But this one, we used it through interluminal, through the lumen of this one, because it's old enough, you know, 15 years is big enough to accommodate, uh, let us say, either seven or six and a half tube. We'll move to the ease blocker. This one is bifurcated distal tip. As you see, there are two lumens here. Okay, and it is bifurcated. What happened that with the insertion of it also through a single lumen tube, it goes and as if, you know, riding the, the uh, carina. So one cuff will be on the right side and the other cuff will be on the left side. That is for any bilateral procedure. Best example is bilateral sympathectomy actually. But you know, in sympathectomy we don't use, you know, lung uh, deflation as I told you, we use the lung deflations with use of uh, SLT as well as capnosorax. But this is another option where you can use it, the ease blocker. And here I'm going to show you how I'm going to do the ease blocker. rotate the tip nicely. And then insert single human tube lying in the side. And then put the four way adapter as we agreed upon, all independent blocker, four way adapter. Then you insert the blocker. Okay. You, you need to have an assistant like this. Okay. Assistant is very important. You have to train an assistant to help you with the rest of the You cannot do the rest of the anesthesia alone. Okay. Train people around you who will give you good okay. Fiber optic ready. There is a plotter is uncertain. The tail will be the fiber optic ready. Now, number of the Now you will see the fiber optic score. The device for patient is overriding the terrain. One cup will be on the right main dentist, and the cup will be on the left main dentist. You can see that, huh? you see, very clear. Huh? It will appear on the right side of the screen. You can watch it here on the right side. Domestic anesthesia is a bit demanding. Huh? It needs a lot of uh, practice as well as reading, you know. So it is a bit demanding subspeciality. So this is the, uh, here you can see membranous part and the tracheal part anterior, carina right side, left side, and then you will see now the uh, bifurcated tip of the ease blocker going over the carina. Okay, if you stuck here, you can just external laryngeal manipulations from outside, then push, it will go without saying, as it appear in this, you know, external, remember external laryngeal manipulation. You can see now it goes without saying, okay? In, uh, in, 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 in a patient who is tracheostomite, this was a cardiac patient, cardiac surgical patient, after surgery, patient need tracheostomy, tracheostomy done, and then he develop an empyema, there will be a decortication, so they need lung deflation. So we use the ease blocker for that purpose. So ease blocker can be used, or even other blockers can be used for any patient with tracheostomy. And this is the adapter, four-way adapter.
you have to have an assistant because you can you can hold the Then we will see the screen and you can see now the comment okay. is not the is uh, I have a tape manually. Okay, let's move to the another one, which is the independent blocker, the scoop deck blocker from uh, Japan. You know, it has an auto inflation button here. This auto inflation button, and there is an auto inflation balloon. I'll I'll show you what is the advantage of this. You know. It is a PVC actually, it is not silicon type bronchial blocker, but the balloon is, the bronchial balloon is silicon type. And here is a TAPA. TAPA is the same like the Coptec, the same. Uh, but you know, after uh, 10 years of patent, you know, uh, then any company can produce uh, the same, which happened here, this is TAPA is from China. So this is the same like the Coptec. There is no difference. Actually, and here how we use it, you know, this is the type of blocker. You know? What happened that this is the reservoir, you know, air reservoir or inflation reservoir, you know, that, you know okay. inflation on ICC. And then this is auto inflation button. When you press on it, slowly it deflates. It doesn't inflate the cuff, you know, like uh, suddenly, but it's slowly inflating it. And this is one of the advantage of using this. Uh, the other advantage of using it, that the internal diameter of it is about nine French uh, size of it, is around 2.5 millimeter. This is the largest internal diameter among all independent blockers. This is type of block. Okay, and this is one of the features which I like in this uh, block. Okay, so I just the this is last time. And here you can see it in human, this one, this live patient, you know, where you can see by the cuff, you insert it all through the same, you know, through the adapter and then insert it your cuff until you land it either right side or left side. Okay. Okay. So this is the corona, right side, left side. And then slowly you inflate the cup with the auto inflation. Not sudden inflation. You can appreciate the lung is down, as you see here. And then you do this test when you try to move on. And the speed of lung deflation with use of type of blocker actually is uh, excellent compared to other blockers. You might say, okay, bronchial blockers is uh, safe and we can use it without any problems. No, this is not true. In 2021, bronchial rupture following endobronchial blocker placement, case report of, of, of this complication. This one happened with uh, the uh, one of the bronchial blockers. And you can see the uh, here the trachea and here the left hemian bronchus and the, uh, uh, the trauma. What happened here left main bronchus and here is after uh, suturing it. And this one, another one, case report iatrogenic bronchial uh, rupture, you know, this is also can happen. And this happened with the um, nine, nine French uh, unit blocker, Fuji blocker, okay. And this was uh, published in 2022. This is very recent, you know. And you know, the ease blocker here, ease blocker pierced the left main bronchus, as you see here, you know. 
bronchus perforation by his blocker, you know. So this also can happen. One has to be very careful. There are there are a couple here also there is tip fracture of this uh, coup deck or tapa blocker, you know, tip fracture. As I said, you know, this part is PVC. Only the cuff is flexible or silicon type, you know. But the other thing is this is very rigid, you know. If it bends here or there, it can rupture easily. And here another also, you know, this scoop deck also. And here transaction, because, you know, if you forgot to uh, withdraw the uh, the blocker while the surgeon started to put the stapler, it can be cut, you know, piece of it can be through the staple line, you know. So that's why we have to be very careful and follow the surgical steps. This another one, which is minor complications of either uh, use of double human tubes or uh, bronchial blockers, which in the form of hoarseness of voice or sorcerers, you know, there are different grades of uh, these minor complications, but also it hurts the patient post-operatively. One has to be very careful of that. To uh, summarize all of these uh, blockers, there is the Arnold blocker, Cohen, uni blocker is blocker auto-inflated Taba blocker, as I said, you know, the auto inflated Taba 9 French 2.5 millimeter, it, you cannot compete with other blockers. All other blockers, maximum here for under blocker 1.4 internal diameter, Cohen blocker 1.6 internal diameter, Uni blocker 2 is blocker 2 millimeter internal diameter. The largest is the, this one, Taba blocker. But how to speed the uh, deflation? Our line deflation during the use of these blockers, there is this connection technique. What you do, disconnect the patient from the respirator, deflate the pilot cuff and wait for 60 seconds or more, it depends that the patient tolerating it. Then inflate the pilot cuff and connect the patient to the respirator. And you can repeat it twice, once after uh, insertion of the bronchial blocker and the, another time after positioning of the patient for surgery. I just finish with these two slides on the lung isolation, which we published in SCGA. You know, you can see that uh, here, this is just uh, a lung isolation algorithm and you can follow, follow, follow here. I just pick up this one, which is difficult airway. If you have a difficult airway, yes. Then think of single human tube. If there is wet lung, then Yes, then you think of left side double human tube with the uh, airway exchange catheter from Cook. Or if there is no wet lung, then you can use bronchial blockers. Univent, Arnold, is Fuji through the single human tube. And this is another algorithm which we also uh, added on the anesthesia for video assisted thoracic surgery. Is we have defined the, uh, the VATS into either tube divets or tubeless vets. Here, this is something recently, you know, on, came on board where they use the either LMA with sedation or periportal local anesthesia with sedation, intercostal nerve block with sedation, intraperitin, intrapleural nerve, nerve install, um, intrapleural local anesthetic installation with sedation, paravertebral block with sedation, TAA, or infusions with remifentanyl, propofol, or dexamethasone. This is Something a new tubeless came, but you know it has you have to select the patient properly before you proceed for that. If a tubed one for video assisted vets or rats, you know, uh, then with isolation, with no isolation, then you follow the same algorithm as given before. Then this is the take home message: average anesthesiologist should master anatomy of the tracheobronchial tree, fiber optic bronchoscope, chest X-ray, CT scan reading double human tube size and the insertion depth, and only one type of bronchial blocker in case of difficult airway. All these uh, things are available in this special issue of thoracic anesthesia of SGA 2021 published. This is our fellowship program. This first graduate, we have it for seven years now. First graduate, then second graduate, third, and this is the third one, sorry, the third one on board. He is with us. He will finish Dr. Musab in uh, December this year. And this is Dr. Malik. He is going to finish next year, December, inshallah. Uh, these are the kind of workshops, this teaching board, which is behind me here. You're using it for the teaching. 
on this. Uh, and this is some of the workshops, 20 or three. We started 20 or three. The first one we conducted in <coughs> Surasa and see a workshop in Riyadh. And this is also in Paris, also we introduced it in the, and this one, Peter Slinger was asked, you know, in one of the workshops in Luxor, in Riyadh also, in Oman, this one, in Cairo, in Germany with Edmund Cohen, in Cape Town, in South Africa, Riyadh, in Cairo, in Riyadh again, Riyadh, in Medina, Manawara, in Dubai, in Jeddah, in Riyadh. And this is for our residents 2021. And this one is 25th of June, 2022. <clears throat> and in August, 2022, and this is a recent one, which we just uh, had it, you know, 22nd of October. And uh, the coming one will be in 21st of January. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much, Professor, for this very exciting presentations. And uh, unfortunately, we have only two questions so far from audiences. And um, first of all, I want to start with your conclusion about the average anesthesiologist and your uh, leadership role in educating and training people uh, throughout your career. And I'll start without further ado with the two questions received. The first of them, and uh, the colleague is asking in case of you are using capnosorax, and uh, he's asking following surgery, following conclusion of surgery, would the surgeon put a chest tube or just do going to do manual deflation with valsalva or uh, post pressure ventilation and just inserting a drain to avoid inserting of chest tube uh, regarding um, the recommendations from ERAS to minimize the use of uh, chest tubes to single chest tube and to minimize the days to one to two days post-operatively? Actually, they, uh, this is a very good question because when you, when you ask the, me this question and the initial attempts of using the capnosorax, I would agree with you, you know, we're doing it, you know, in the initial attempts, you know, which was in 2001. And uh, okay, we were putting the chest tube and we do chest x-ray in the recovery room. We ensure that there is no capnosorax, that the lung is totally inflated. But actually nowadays we are not doing it anymore. What we are doing is silastic tube at the end of surgery and Valsalva, as exactly the colleague said, and until we ensure that the lung is under vision, is totally inflated, okay, no collapse at all. And then we remove this elastic tube with positive end expiratory pressure, okay? The surgeon is removing it and I'm holding manually with Valsalva, ensuring that the lung is totally inflated. Then we send the patient to the recovery room. Actually, we don't do at all nowadays any chest X-ray in the recovery room. Okay, interesting. Yes, there is a related question just received. Uh, do you use the TOL gabnography and uh, when you are using W tube to confirm the proper position? Not really. No, no, we are yeah. not uh, routinely using it. No. Yeah, uh, there is another question received. Uh, could you kindly? give a quick brief about uh, the use of double human tube or plucker in case of lung isolation is needed in ICU patients. Uh, ICU patients, you need lung isolation for ventilation, you mean? Like bronchopleural fistula or anything like that? Um, I'm not sure about the question. Uh, he might asking about a patient with hemopsis or might uh, asking about a patient with um, this chron disharmony between the two lungs uh, regarding the disease. So, for example, you have a restrictive in one lung and obstructive in the other lung, something like this. I think I think of, this is actually not my domain to answer this question in ICU setting, but uh, I can tell you, you know, uh, when I was doing, you know, ICU, I used to teach, you know, our residents and our, you know, staff, even nursing staff. What is this, you know, tube? How to deal with it? What is a blocker? Because it happened, you know, several times when you enter, a, admit a patient with a blocker, they don't know what the blocker is, you know. And then suddenly, you know, some problems happen or can happen. But uh, using double human tube and uh, or a blocker, yes, I think for differential lung ventilation, you can have double human tube if you have ventilating with different setting for either lungs is possible, yes. 
or for bronchopleural fistula. Come on, Dr. Muhammad is pioneer in high frequency ventilation in these kind of cases. So that is the uh, situation where you uh, need to put double lumen or bronchial blocker in the IC. Thank you, Professor. I can also uh, add about this point for some centers um, when you are going to admit a patient from uh, who want uh, who need the post-operative ventilation with a double human tube in situ, the clinicians or intensivists are very worried about it to receive the patient in such way and you have to replace the tube with a single human tube if lung isolation is needed. So it is, yeah, yes, the practice varies among centers. There is a question received, though, what is the role of uh, endobronchial blocker in patients with uh, tracheoesophageal fistula? Oh, yeah, yeah it, it, has, it has a role, but, you know, there is no definite thing because, you know, uh, you, it depends on the site of the fistula, you know, where, where is it, you know. There are different classes for it, you know, it has to be diagnosed properly, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah. To, to be honest, a single human tube is uh, is better than anything else. But once you diagnose where is a fistula, and then you can place the tube either uh, beyond it. Uh, usually, we use it beyond you know the fistula in order not to have any gastric uh, distension. But there is no place for W tube. Sorry for the bronchial blocker okay. in that regard. Thank you, Professor. Um, so far, no more questions. Uh, I have a question for you. You are uh, you will explain about the role of capnosorax and uh, its hemodynamic consequences, negative consequences on hemodynamics. And you uh, will say the recommended using of low pressures, depending on the side of surgery at 12 from 6 to 8 on left and 8 to 10 on right, which is mandatory. The question for you, Prof, um, what is the rate of insufflation? flu rate for CO2. Do you have a certain rate? Half to one. A half liter per minute, half one liter minute. per minute. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in this range. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also regarding this, are you using cabnosorax with W and tube? We have uh, some surgeons so started to use cabnosorax for sympathetic to me, but they required using pause, W and tube and insufflation. There is no need actually, Dr. Muhammad, for W and tube. I totally agree, yeah. <laughs> but you know, one thing I wanted to mention here, you know, if, if we have a double human tube insert, like like case of nowadays, they are doing the rats, you know, thoracoscopic yes. thyroidectomy. Yesterday we have one, one patient, you know, the position of the patient will be supine. Huh? They don't put yes. the patient dead lateral. So that's why in that case, you know, we need to put the capnosorax as well. There is a double human tube, yes, but with capnosorax. This yeah. is maybe the only indication left for using both double human tube and capnosorax. Yeah, I want to explain that the professor is meaning for robotic thoracoscopic surgery, is it correct? Yeah. yeah. Uh, also, I have a question for you, professor. Um, I think is uh, might a question coming for the mind of everyone attending here, which is best, a double human tube or plucker? And I think you already compared the different types of blocker. What are you, do you suggest or recommend a certain blocker for certain patients or individual patients? Actually, if I, if I would recommend any of these blockers, I would go for the ease blocker, actually. This is my favorite one. But since the TAPA came on market, you know, and I have seen, you know, the uh, rap rapidly deflation of the lung, you know, I may be, you know, thinking now of uh, having it also on board because it rapidly deflates the lung versus any other bronchial blocker. Yes, I echo your uh, comment, Professor. Yes, and uh, I want to also to highlight what you will say. The TABA bronchial blocker has the largest internal diameter in the market, uh, followed by Fuji Uni blocker, which is uh, helping for expedition of lung collapse. Um, which is best, the Professor, W and tube or plucker? And honestly, yes, we have some surgeons who would be very panic when you are using a blocker. They have in their mind the blocker is a disease, is something which led, uh, which wouldn't lead to lung to be completely deflated, and they would make uh, their day a bad day. And, I, and I, I agree with you. You know, you know the thing is that you know once you put a bronchial blocker. 
if the first bronchial blocker you insert and the lung was not uh, properly deflated and not properly, the blocker was not properly, you know, uh, used, you know, then the surgeon will have this, you know, forever. He will never change the mind if you are going to use the bronchial blocker again. So I think, I think, uh, I think we have, you know, a communication, way of communication will be very important between surgeon and the anesthetist, especially in thoracic anesthesia. And maybe in other surgical, uh, you know, uh, domains, uh, there is no problem. You can relax. But no, in thoracic, uh, as you know, you know, you are practicing and you know that. But this is for our colleagues watching us, you know, there should be a rapport between surgeon and the anesthetist, you know. And I agree that uh, the uh, but, uh, proper use of actually bronchial blockers and the use of disconnection technique, which can speed the deflation of the lung. I think this can make a hell of a difference. Thank you, Professor. There is a coming question. Uh, a suction would be more difficult through bronchial blockers in case if there is a uh, vicious secretions or a lot of secretions accumulated beyond the blocker cuff. If, as I said, you know, for wet lung syndromic patients, you don't use bronchial blocker. You go for W mature. But if the patient is clean lung, you know, there is no secretion, nothing, then you can go for bronchial blockers. Yeah. I have also a question. Um, I think you needed to um, highlight, Professor, about uh, is it possible to us to drive while we are closing our eyes in other terms, are we using one lung ventilation with the blockers or W tube without using a fiber scope? Fiber, fiber optic scope is mandatory. You know, exactly. there is no consensus here, actually. Okay. I, is there any questions from the audiences? Any questions from the panel? Uh, professor Safa, if you have any questions for the Professor Daulatli? Of course, um, my great professor, uh, Dr. Daulatli, uh, clarify every point in a very comprehensive and very informative way. So uh, the, the question is um, uh, covered by his uh, way of uh, teaching today a, a, a reference lecture in thoracic anesthesia from all uh, its uh, uh, stone point. Uh, uh, يعني, uh, covering every point بشكل أنا أول مرة أسمعه بالشكل ده ونحس إن إحنا we are uh, يعني في 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 بستان من الزهور مش في سراسك أنافيزيا اللي هي طول عمرها دايف كلت واللي طول عمرها إحنا بنخاف نذكرها حتى لكن دكتور دولتي دخلنا في بستان كده كله ورود وحاجات جميلة ويقطف لنا منها ويهدينا كل أنواع الجمال في سراسك أنافيزيا جاردن Thank you so much, Professor. Before I close, there is a repeated question from one of the colleagues asking for a PDF or a PowerPoint uh, version from your slides, if you agree on this, to grant them. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Hey, I have to say, 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 Thanks okay. so much, okay. Professor. It was an amazing yeah. uh, evening and it was a great discussion. And, uh, yeah. Exciting, so exciting. And uh, yeah. presentation yes. from talent and well experienced uh, professor and uh, thoracic anesthesiologist. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much, Professor Safa, for organizing this evening. And uh, at the end, I thank all delegates to coming and uh, to. Uh, um, this is a Friday evening in this event. Thanks so much and see you soon. Thank you, Dr. Tahan. Thank you for your valuable time, for your valuable effort. Thank you for sharing us kindly and support us kindly. Many thanks. I have no suitable words or suitable letters to appreciate my thanks and the great honor for my great professor, Dr. Daulati, for giving us our, his time and effort. Uh, kindly and support me and support my team and my colleagues I mean, and my juniors. Dr. Daulatli, 
uh, please um, uh, accept my appreciation and the great honor to have you share this happy night, this happy night uh, and uh, amazing night by your valuable information, comprehensive lecture and, uh, uh, and your valuable time. So many, many, many thanks for you, my great Professor Dawlatli. Thank you, Professor Dr. Tahan, for your valuable time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.